But the goal is to answer everyone. All right, so it's 12.03. Shall we go ahead and get started? Let's do this. Great. Um, all right, so hi, welcome everyone to our discussion on how to build your book marketing platform and stay sane with Elizabeth Kaufman. Uh, my name is Taryn Edwards and I manage the activities for writers at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco, uh, which is steps away from Montgomery BART station um, and it's a pioneering library, cultural event center and chess club founded in 1854. All right, so just to let you know that this program will be recorded for future viewing and by registering for and attending this program, you acknowledge that your name and your image uh, may be included in the recording. Since we're using the webinar function, the cameras, your cameras are turned off, but Taryn, Elizabeth, and Barbara's cameras are on. All righty, so this event I'm thrilled to host and it's been uh, produced in partnership with the San Francisco Writers Conference and the San Francisco chapter of the Women's National Book Association. Uh, two entities with whom I work heavily uh, to provide writing classes and other learning experiences relevant to the San Francisco Bay Area writing community at the Mechanics Institute. Um, today our speaker is Elizabeth Kaufman and she is the social media director for the San Francisco Writers Conference. Uh, she's also an uh, an editor for independent clients and for publishing companies. And she's also a, a rigorous writer, writing coach, um, book coach. And she helps writers find their voices and connect to their, uh, connect with their creativity. So you can learn more about her at www.writingrefinery.com. And I also put her URL and email address in the, at the beginning of the chat thread. We also have on camera Barbara Santos, uh, who you, many of you know as marketing director of the San Francisco Writers Conference and the Writing for Change Conference. Barbara, quick question. Will writing for change happen? It will happen. <laughs> Great. How it's going to happen is we're still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so the way the uh, event today is going to work is Elizabeth will share some not some, most of, a lot of her knowledge um, for about 10 minutes and then we'll be in conversation with her uh, to address your questions. So um, uh, we have a pretty good sized audience today. So why don't you write your questions in the chat room? And as I said earlier, we will fold them into the conversation as naturally as possible and we'll try to answer everyone. All right, thank you so much. Welcome Elizabeth and Barbara. Thank you. Thanks for having us um, and me especially. I'm so happy to be able to come and share with you guys um, just a little bit about um, what I see as a challenge that a lot of writers are facing right now and that's how to build your marketing platform, your book marketing platform and stay sane right now because it's a crazy world we live in. So I'm actually going to start us off, if you don't mind, um, if everyone could just take a moment from where you're sitting um, to put your feet flat on the floor and put your hands in your lap and close your eyes and just take a breath. Breathe in deep all the way down into your belly. Hold it for a second and then breathe out and open your eyes. And let's just all be here and be present right now. Um, it's, we're not going lots of places because we're in lockdown, but it's crazy times right now. And so just being able to take the space and like breathe and be here um, is really important. And I hope you can feel that and just feel a little bit of grounding right now. So I'm just gonna jump in really quick with my, um, with my slides here. Um, and we'll talk about how to build your book marketing platform and stay sane. So um, there are three different, um, <laughs> of course it's gonna be, sorry, it's gonna be cranky with me right now. I'm gonna 
work with my technology here. Um, and you, you guys know how this goes, right? You know, you know oh, the technology. Absolutely. The technology can be a pain. Um, I don't know why you don't want to work with me. Oh, slideshow? Go to slideshow. I'm not even seeing it. I'm just going to click up here. It's like too, uh, there we go. There we go. Got it. Okay. So there are three different platforms that I wanted to talk about in general um, that are the highest trafficked platforms that we're using um, on social media these days, and that's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and I'm going to assume that you're on at least one of these platforms already. Um, and that is awesome uh, because like, we need to be building um, that conversation and um, connecting with your readers wherever you can find them. So finding your audience, that is the most important thing that we're looking for right now. And if you're not seeing engagement on a particular platform that you've been on for a while, it might be time to pivot and try something new. Um, so I just wanted to point out these three platforms and what um, types of content resonates there really quick. Um, and then you can like take time to consider for your particular um, subject matter, um, whatever that book is, whoever your ideal reader is, where you think they might be on, in the social media world. Um, so we have Facebook, which is a little bit more short form writing. Um, it's definitely <coughs> meme driven. I don't know if you, when you look at Facebook, you see lots of different um, stuff that is being shared around um, that a lot of it is political. Um, a lot of it is also then, you know, things to distract us from things that are political. So um, if you're in the Facebook world, it's really based around that like community idea, building those groups and talking to people about subjects that you resonate, that resonate with them and that are exciting to you or that um, are directly related to the things that you're writing about. Then we have Instagram, um, which is image driven, um, short form captioning, you can't, you can't spend too long writing out some, your manifesto on Instagram before it gets cut off. So, um, you, and you, people are less likely to read the captions if they're not captivated by the image that you're sharing with them. Um, so you really wanna like think about, you know, is the work that you're trying to market visual? Um, are you marketing an art book maybe? Or um, how can you represent the things that you're writing about in a visual way that will catch your potential reader's eye um, and then draw them in to want to follow you and have that conversation with you. Um, and then we have Twitter and Twitter has changed a lot in the past um, few years. Like it used to just be a stream of text and that was it. Like you had 140 characters and it just kept like refreshing and new people were saying more things. Um, and like you could only say so much in each tweet. And so then you had a string of tweets that would get your point across. But now they have video and image capabilities there too. So um, there's a little bit more wiggle room to try and figure out how to communicate with your audience. But like I'm saying, there's, there's different, um, the, each of these is a little bit different. And so being able to um, just take some time to play with um, a, di a different platform that you haven't used yet um, can be really good right now because, because everybody is on the internet right now and everybody is shouting all at the same time. And um, so the idea is to figure out how to say something that's relevant um, and that will connect with your readers in the right like place. So if you have this beautiful long post that you want to share with people, um, your thoughts that you've been writing out, probably Twitter is not going to be the right um, platform for you. Um, but that's, you can, you can, you can kind of um, work with each one of those and just see what's working and then change to, um, to something new if you need to, mm -hmm. to, um, to get a better result. So pick one platform and then get really good at it. 
Um, and then once you feel like you've mastered that, you can move on to the next one, but definitely don't try to spread yourself thin and, or be repeating content across mediums too much because, um, again, you're going to draw a different kind of audience in different places. So you want to iterate and you want to stay as relevant as you can. Hmm. And so then my main, my main point, uh, that I like to share with people when I talk about building your social media platform is that you, I congratulate anybody who has thousands and thousands upon millions of followers on Facebook and Twitter and um, Instagram and how, whatever those platforms are. Um, but all of those social media platforms should be a funnel for getting people to your website and onto your email list. Um, your email list is the only form of communication that you actually control to be able to share information and have conversation and connection with your readers. Um, Facebook could decide to ban you for any reason at any time. They don't have to have cause. It's their platform and their people who, um, their eyeballs, their audience that they're sharing with you. And it's nice that they give you algorithms and um, paid ways to connect with different people on that audience, but it does not actually belong to you. So I'm just going to harp on it a little bit uh, as we go along, but definitely make sure that you are drawing people back to your email list because that's where you have complete control over exactly how you want to share with people. You can share frequent short emails. You can share super long, um, thoughtful, heartfelt emails. You can share videos however you want through your email delivery system. Um, and, and those people that sign up, unless they unsubscribe, like they're your eyeballs to look at and to, to share with and to um, listen to and be in dialogue with. So um, because the world is so weird and inconsistent right now, I just want to point out that consistency is most important. Um, and pick, like figuring out what you can do um, and that you can maintain over the long haul is going to be important as well. Um, because if you send a flurry of posts or um, emails or whatever it is right now, and then you don't say anything for months, um, that is gonna confuse your audience. And you, or you may have people that unsubscribe from your email list because you sent like 20 emails in one week um, when that's not, that's not like how you're gonna communicate with people regularly. Um, and also like maybe you feel like you have tons of time to be posting right now um, or to be emailing people, but like when life goes back to whatever the new normal looks like, you want to be able to maintain that pace of communication. So um, taking that time to stop and breathe and know yourself and know what makes you happy and how um, you, when you add more responsibilities or more activities to your list, um, you're going to be able to maintain that is important. Um, and then I just wanted to say that like knowing what you're talking about, what your voice is, what your message is to your readers and to the world through your art, through your um, creative practice, through your, um, the books that you're writing, that is the most important. So um, it's possible that you could dive in and capitalize on some perceived opportunity, but, um, but you're going to lose part of that audience over time if it's not the content that is actually like authentically resonating with you and who you are. Um, so just keep thinking about that as you're building your audience that you're trying to organically cultivate um, a readership that is connected to you and to the things that you're interested in so that as you continue to share, they continue to be interested. Um, there's also just like a side note in here, like you could buy as many followers as you want for whatever platform that exists. There are ways to do that. And so then you could, you know, perhaps go to a publisher and say, ta-da, I have 100,000 followers on Twitter. Look at my platform. But none of those followers are going to be actual, like, engaged and interested members of your community. They're just numbers on the page. So, um, 
sharing content that is relevant to what you're writing about and to what you care about and to what your readers care about is the most important thing. And doing that consistently um, and being engaged with your audience is what counts. And this is the main point that I want to make. And that is, again, that it takes time. You can't just overnight have success. Uh, some people can maybe, but there's like this, it's like that weird um, confluence of all the right things happening at the right time to shoot skyrocket somebody into fame. And for most of us, it's going to be um, one reader at a time, one follower at a time. You welcome them in and say, awesome, we're so glad you're here. And here's how we're going to connect together. So if you feel like your numbers are going slowly, I just want to stop and encourage you that that's exactly how it's going to go. Um, and, and it's exactly right. And you're doing, you're doing the work. And then next, your book is not for everyone. So if you have people that follow you and then decide to unfollow you, try not to take it personally. Um, because it's not about you really. It's about people having lots of different interests um, and lots of different voices all shouting them at them at the same time. And eventually you have to be able to curate to, you know, this and not this. I'm, I have time for this and not this. So your book will not be for every single person and that's totally okay because you're building your audience. So the best gift you can give is to stop trying to please everyone and to um, talk about the things that you care about and tune out the rest of the noise um, and take your time, take that time to build each um, individual, um, what do I want to say, to build what you're trying to say in such a way that your readers um, keep coming back to, um, to you again and again and are excited to be able to like have that um, connection and to um, learn more about the things that you're interested in. So um, the last couple of slides I have here, and I can just share these um, as we go along, or I can um, email the slides to anybody who's interested in it later, but I have um, some thoughts here on how to cultivate your Zen when you're not feeling creative or motivated and how to practice self-care and boundaries around social media because it bleeds into everything. Um, so these are just a few ideas for you when you're not feeling creative or motivated to reach out. Um, and I'm just going to take a quick second to tell you that like at the beginning of this lockdown in March, um, everybody was all of a sudden in a panic and like worried about, um, how to respond or like what to do and, um, and there were a lot of people that jumped into that space with leadership and like how to like cultivate things and how to, um, uh, how to encourage people and how to like build that creative practice or do this or do that. And I, um, being the, the writing coach that I am, I felt like I should really be doing that too. But also at the beginning of the lockdown, I got sick. And I was sick for like three weeks with this horrible cold. It was really not good. And so I did not feel at all like reaching out. And I felt bad ab about myself for not doing it. And then I remembered that, oh yeah, I need to take care of myself first. And then once I feel better, then I'm able to reach out. Or once I feel better, and then I'm able to create more. So um, I just wanted to offer that to you guys as well, even though we've been in this space now for a couple of months and we're starting to feel like there's some kind of routine going on, maybe some of us, hopefully, um, that like you still need to check in with yourself and make sure that you, um, if you're feeling resistance, drink some water, take a break, go for a walk, try something new. Um, and hopefully that'll inspire you to find some more content to create and be able to share with the people that um, have signed on willingly to be part of your community um, and want to hear from you. And then the, my last slide is just here for how to practice self-care and boundaries around social media. 
Um, and this ties back into part of that staying sane while you're building your platform. You're trying new platforms, you're trying different things, you're trying different frequencies of sending things out. But like your social media and marketing and your platform, that is not the purpose of your life. That is a thing that you do to support the purpose of your life, which is to create your art. So if you don't want to feel sucked in by it, um, I recommend that you give yourself a time limit every day, that you put it on your calendar that for 30 minutes, I'm going to work on sending out my Instagram posts or make, you know, um, liking other people's posts or sharing stuff on Facebook or um, whatever it is that you're going to do, but give yourself a time limit and don't go beyond it. Um, that way you can have that compartmentalized time and you're doing what you need to do each day and being regular about it. Um, but you're also not like getting sucked in and doing it for hours on end, which can happen because that's what like social media wants you to keep your eyes on them and not on the other things that you're working on. So give yourself a time limit, um, plan a schedule of posts in advance if you can, so that you can either use a scheduling tool to be able to send those out or um, you can just wake up in the morning and say, I know what I'm sending today and put it out there. Um, and um, that way you're not spending a whole lot of time each day thinking about what it is that you will need to post for that day. Um, turn off your notifications. Like there's really not usually a need for Facebook to have your attention all the time. Like it does not need to make your phone buzz. It does not need to jump up and tell you that so-and-so liked your post. You, um, that's one more way that like they bleed into the rest of your day. So turn off your notifications. And then when you're during your um, scheduled time, you can go onto your app and look at whatever it is that you want to. Um, and then I say use block mute and unfriend liberally. Um, like it's fine in some uh, platforms you can, people can follow you and you don't have to follow them back. Um, so that you can curate your feed. Um, but like you don't, there are certain things that <laughs> you don't need to have coming up in your feed or into your direct messages all the time. And so um, like you are not required to provide that kind of access to yourself through um, social media either. So be selective about who it is that gets to join you and like have access to you and Make sure that you, um, you set up guidelines for how people are supposed to behave and boundaries for how people are supposed to interact with you. And then you can maintain those with the use of these tools. So that's, um, that's the end of my slides. And I wanted to know, I'm guessing there are some questions. I think I could see some of that coming up in there. So I'm going to- Yeah, start. I just wanted to say uh, the, the advice you gave at the end about about blocking and setting limits and, and boundaries. I thought that was really great and yeah, very timely advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we have a lot of questions here. Oh, good. Uh, uh, let's see, let me scroll up here and see what we've got. Um, one question from Justine, she, she wanted to know if there was a particular demographic that you can kind of associate with the various platforms. Uh, she wants to know, in her experience, she um, uh, sees a lot of older folks on Facebook and she's just wondering if that's yeah, that's, that what you experience. <laughs> it, it is. Um, you're going to find uh, probably that 18 to like 50, 60 some on Instagram. Um, that's that kind of age range that's there. And then a lot of people that are 16 above on um, Facebook, there was a, an article I was just reading the other day that broke down the numbers for that. Um, and if I can find it, I can, I can email it to people who are interested in seeing those numbers up front. But that's definitely true that you do, if your audience is in an older um, and above 60 demographic, then you're probably like looking to find them on Facebook and not on Twitter. Um, Twitter is a little bit fast paced um, in that kind of way. So and yeah, um, somebody says, yes, she'd like that article. So awesome. I'll write down to be able to send it to you. Uh, 
great. Um, Kate was wondering what service you use to integrate video onto Facebook or onto your other uh, social media streams. Well, so in Facebook and Instagram, especially, um, you have, um, they have video capabilities built right in. So then you can, if you want to um, create a video on your phone or um, on your computer, um, however you want, you can post that directly to those platforms. Um, Instagram is different from Facebook in that regard. Facebook, you, I don't know that there, what the time limit is on videos. Um, on Instagram, if you're going to put something in a feed, you get one minute of video. Um, you can use stories and get a little bit longer. It just breaks it into chunks. Um, and then they have Instagram TV where you can, they call it IGTV, and you can post really long videos there if you want to. Um, and like, and then you can share a clip of it into your Instagram feed so that people who are looking and scrolling through can find that and then go to IGTV to watch the rest of your video. Um, it's kind of like a teaser. Um, yeah. So, it, yeah, go ahead. ahead. You, you finish. Oh, I was just going to say, if you are using, um, if you're talking about like um, using uh, email to send videos to people or that kind of thing, um, you will want to check with the particular email provider that you're using. Like if I'm using MailChimp, they have, I think, a way to integrate YouTube videos. Um, and your main problem is really figuring out where you're going to, where you're hosting all of the videos that you are sending to people, um, whether you're hosting that on a private server or whether you're hosting those videos on YouTube or some other paid service like Vimeo or whatever that you can put there and then um, add in um, those kind of integrations into your email to send to people. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the hardest part is knowing, because I mean, you know, probably all too well, just like I do that, your iPhone, um, it, you know, it, sure, it has tons of storage and also it's super limited. Videos take up a lot of space. And so then like getting those out and off into the hands of people who are interested in them is, um, is the important part. And then, I mean, that's why YouTube is such um, a popular venue for people is that they can host their videos elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about the importance of not relying just on social media to develop a following, but to right. drop, use social media to, to channel it into uh, your personal website and your personal email list and all of that. Um, Cindy had a question uh, on, I guess, on Facebook and Twitter, you can include your own personal website, but mm -hmm. on Instagram, she says that you can't. And she was wondering if there's a tool or what sort of strategy you would use to drive traffic from Instagram to your website? Yeah. So um, you do in the, in your um, profile on Instagram have space to put a link, but you only get to put one link on um, Instagram. And so um, I use um, two things. One, um, I use in the captioning on Instagram, and you have a call to action, right? Like anytime you're doing, like whether you're sending an email or um, like putting a post onto Facebook, um, you have a call to action at the end of it, whether it's for people to respond and, you know, answer a question or to sign up for something on your email. So um, when you say that um, in Instagram, you can't, you're right, you can't have a direct link listed there but you just, most people say the link is in the bio. And so then what that indicates to anybody who's reading that is to click through to your profile and see the link that's there. And so you can change that link, you know, all the time, anytime, however you want to. Um, but if you're somebody who has regularly different offerings going at once that you'd like to be able to have people um, access, there's a program that you can use uh, the free version or you can, I think, pay for upgraded features that's called Linktree. Um, and I'm gonna put that in the chat for people. It's called Linktree. And mine, I use Linktree for my websites and actually use it for the San Francisco Writers Conference um, Instagram as well, which if you're not following us, you should come follow us, San Fran Writers. Um, we'd love to see you there. Um, but Linktree will give you 
a custom URL that when people click on that, it takes them to a few different um, selection choices. So then you can change those links out whenever you want to or add more and it can be a really long list if you want to of sign up for my newsletter or check out this free video that I made or um, download this, you know, packet for writers, that kind of thing um, is all listed in there. And so that's people ha how people are getting around the, you can only have one live link and it only goes on your bio on Instagram. Oh, that was a thorough answer. <laughs> yeah. <I'll> do my best. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, earlier, when you first started your slideshow, you mentioned the importance of um, curating your social media audience, but what about curating your posts? Yeah. Should, should you really, do, um, Rick had a question asking, you know, how much duplication should you really have on Twitter and Facebook, for example? I mean, you kind of want to show your voice and show your personality in each stream, but you also want it to be different and, and authentic. How right. much is too much as far as duplication? Um, so I think you can get away with it a little bit. Um, but knowing that like, so if you are connecting to the same audience, like the same people exactly on Twitter and on in Instagram or Facebook, then like that's, it, it feels like a little bit like you're doing, I guess, too much work, even though like if you're using buffer, you can put, you know, the same post in three places with one click. And that's nice to be able to do that. And we can talk about that again in a second, but um, you just like, there's different um, types of information that get more activity on each of those platforms. And that's really what I'm talking about. It can all lead back to the same um, idea and the same blog post or the same, you know, whatever it is that you want to talk about that is away from Twitter or Facebook. Um, but like on Twitter, um, the picture that you post on Instagram is not going to, it won't size right. Um, it won't feel and work as well. Um, so you just need to be able to, you can have, you know, the same ideas even, um, and, um, how you put it onto that platform changes a little bit, but then also how you expect people to interact with you on that platform may change as well. Where like in Facebook, you tend to see lots of like comment interaction um, and that kind of thing, people um, having conversations. And Twitter, it's a little bit harder. Um, it happens, but it happens in a different manner. So like just being able to, to again, note that the long post that you want to put on Facebook is not really going to translate to Twitter or to Instagram even. Um, right. So like just being able to be aware of that. And that'll kind of help you decide what sort of persona you want to have on right. Facebook versus Twitter. Like if you wanted, like Rick mentioned, ask how much of, um, how much of his posts should be about personal interest versus books and how his privacy settings should be set. But it sounds like, there's no one answer. It just depends on what you want out of the social media experience as well. Yeah. And again, you're looking to connect with your readers. So personal interests are great to share as long as they're going to be the same personal interests that your readers share and they have to do with the things that you're writing about. Um, but that's actually why, like, that's why you see a lot of separation between um, people's personal Facebook page and their business Facebook page, right? Like you, that way you have that separation of like the people that are in my business Facebook feed, they are there because they connect to me over the things that I write about and the things that I write about interest me because of this. And they also interest the people that are reading my books. Um, but those people there that are your book readers, most of the time, like sharing pictures of your kids or grandkids, or the food that you ate that night, like that's not necessarily um, good fodder for building your following for your for your business. Um, it's fun to share that with your um, with your family and with your friends, but for the people that are buying your book, there's like a little bit more separation that needs to happen there. The people that can share their kids and their that what food they're eating right now and that stuff, they're like the 
the upper tier, we'll call them, of people who have billions of followers and everybody knows who they are anyways. Like Neil Gaiman, he can post anytime he wants about his kids or about like what, you know, except for that I think he eats Marmite and I'm like not a big fan of that. So he can just keep that to himself. But like, uh, you know, that kind of thing, um, it's fine because he's super famous already. Um, but when he was starting out before he got super famous, he had to be a little bit more targeted in what he's talking about to his social media audience or his email audience or whatever to make it relevant to their interests almost more than it is relevant to yours. It's just, you're looking for that overlap. That's a great answer, particularly when you're tempted to share some sort of uh, <laughs> political thing. Right, yes. <laughs> And we're all being sorely tested these days because there's so much, so much to talk about and think about. How many things you could, you could comment on and you're like, <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, Nada has a question about how to get Twitter followers to be aware of what her handle is. Um, so basically um, when you're building, actually Kathy Turney has a great book on how to build um, a Twitter following. Um, that you should Google her. She's on Instagram, Kathy Turney, Kathy with a C. Um, well, I'll look that up. And, people. but like basically what you're doing when you're on Twitter and you're trying to find followers is you follow people. Um, and Twitter is good at like, you give it like different topics that you're interested in and it will suggest followers for you. Um, and so then you just get out there and you start following people and you, when you are writing about specific topics, you do some research to find out if there's a hashtag that is relevant to the topic that you're writing about and include that. Because when you do that, then you show up in that feed for that hashtag. And so anybody who clicks on that hashtag can see all the tweets that have come out that are on that subject. Um, Twitter is hard if you're looking for like, when you're just starting out, especially if you're looking for that connection and conversation, because when you're just starting out, like you just have like, so um, it feels like everyone is shouting and like, they're all saying things and they're like, the feed just goes by so quickly that it can just feel really overwhelming. Um, but the point with Twitter especially is just like to be doggedly consistent about the things that you are the topics that you're posting on. Um, and again, avoid the, the personal stuff of like, I ate this or I, you know, these things, or here's a picture of my cat. Although there is a hashtag cats of Twitter. So, you know, if you want to be like talking to people about cats, then by all means. And I do that with my personal Twitter feed, actually not my work one, but my, my personal one. So um, if you want to see pictures of my cat, you can follow me at Fair Betty on Twitter. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it's definitely, um, it's, it's more about like getting out there and engaging and um, answering people's questions um, or talking to other people or about topics that other people are talking about on Twitter. And then you can also share um, in like on Facebook with your friends there and, and just remind people that, hey, you're on Twitter and you would love more followers and share your, um, your, face, your Twitter handle there for people. Uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned a um, using a social media manager, yes. and you mentioned Buffer. What, is Hootsuite out and Buffer is in? I keep hearing more about Buffer. It's so many different things. Hootsuite is actually really cool, but I'm pretty sure that the free version of Hootsuite is not as great as the free version of Buffer, and I like to use things for free as much as I can, <laughs> you know? <laughs> until you like hit that point where you really need like that much more management of the posts that you're putting out into the world, like being just using the free service is so much easier. And again, Buffer um, has a really great free um, service available. Great answer there. Let's see, Darcy has a question. What do you think about using uh, oh, she had a question about a separate personal page and then an author page, but maybe we've answered that, the importance of how that is. Um, well, how, how, what do you think about how having separate pages will dilute or um, 
dilute your followers and divide your pool of followers is the words um, Darcy uses. Yeah. So um, the, it's kind of like hard to explain, I guess, but um, the, that the idea would be that you are like, if you're going to talk about books, you put on your author hat and you go to your author page and do that. And you, you have to train your followers, I guess, on your friends on Facebook um, that I'm going to talk about my author stuff over here and like direct them over there. And then um, it becomes about curating that space, right? Like, so that when you're posting on your personal Facebook page, it's for your friends and family, as opposed to your author page, which is for your um, book audience. And the hope being that you have people in your book audience that are not your friends and family. And I know Facebook blurs the lines on everything, all kinds of friendship, right? Like, so we, like, I have thousands of friends on Facebook, yay. But like, do I know most of them personally? No. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, we're connected through the book world. And like, that's what I use Facebook for now. I actually don't have my, my literal friends and family on Facebook anymore because it just wasn't working for me. But, um, but like there's, um, because Facebook has an interest in like who's paying for ads and who's paying for different kinds of services um, on their site, like just posting your author related material through your personal Facebook feed is not guaranteed to get you the audience that you would want. You can't, you can't really manage who is seeing that those posts. Um, and you definitely can't um, see any kind of analytics on who's engaging with it, except for like, oh, like so many people liked this, but if you wanted to know who's clicking through um, your links, or um, how far the reach is for your particular post, you don't get any of that analytics on a personal page. Um, whereas if you have that business page, then you do have access to those analytics and you can use the tools that they have there as well to boost your reach to um, other, other audiences and draw more people in. And again, I'm just gonna go back to like, Facebook is great and lots of people are on it and using it. And also Facebook owns all of those people that are on there and using it. So if you want the assuredness of being able to, to communicate with your audience, you want to train them to go from that author page on Facebook, from your personal page to your author page to your email, because then you get that access to them. What do you think of using freebie giveaways to draw in new audiences? I mean, I absolutely agree with that. I actually am working on um, my own uh, freebie for people to offer in the next couple of weeks. I'm putting together an author created, uh, creative wellness toolkit um, for people who are interested in signing up for my email list um, to be able to send you uh, that kind of information about, um, not information, inspiration. Let's, let's reframe that a little bit for how to um, take care of yourself and fill your creative well so that you're able to do that important creative work. Um, and so I definitely, definitely think having something to give away for free is hugely important in getting people to sign up. Um, and then being able to keep delivering um, valuable content is the way to keep people with you. So and you just you duplicate those efforts on your start on your website and then share that on Facebook and share that yes. via social media. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so what do you think of medium and using that as a promotional tool? Is that really social media or is that is that uh, like a news source like salon.com? I mean, yeah, it is technically social media because um, any, even salon is technically social media. HuffPost, all of that is social media until you get to the people that are actually the paid journalists. Like everybody else is just editorial. Like whatever it is that we have to say, we may be experts on things, but it's not like our journalistic like outlet. We're just, you know, it's a platform that you can use. And um, so I would say if you um, have the creative space 
to be able to um, use Medium and like grow your audience that way. They do have a larger audience that you can be connected to. Um, but again, like Medium owns that audience. Um, and um, I'm not sure I would have to read their um, user agreements, but like they may own the content that you put out there as well. So like you really want to be um, conscious about what it is that you're sharing there. And then again, use it as another tool to drive people back to your email list and to your own personal website where you're sharing exclusively content that is relevant to those people. Okay. I guess it all comes down to who, who owns what and yeah. so it's really something to think about when you're, when you're writing original content and putting it on social media. It's yeah, it's the same with Facebook and with Instagram had a thing. It's been a number of years now, but where they were talking about like who owns the images that are on Instagram and whether they Instagram has a right to use them in promotional material. And basically you sign away your rights to any of the content that you're putting up there. And sure, you get to you know, have it in your feed and that's yours. Um, somebody else, a user of Instagram can't come and steal that from you, but if Instagram wants to use it, like, oh. So, oh. it was a big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's something you don't really think about, but it's mm. so important to keep in mind to, to own your, your work. And I, unfortunately, you'll have to pay for that in terms of Yep. having your own website, your own URL, um, yep. but it is, but it's really important. Um, now crowd management. Do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts on, on how to tactfully get out of a follower relationship? <laughs> um, so I'm going to guess that it's turned contentious, <laughs> this follower <laughs> relationship. And honestly, like what it comes down to is like, depending on how the story is being, con being told, um, like if you need to block somebody or unfriend somebody or whatever you need to do, like you have the freedom and ability to do that at any time. That is totally on you, um, to be able to do that. Um, and if you're, and you know, then like if it's public enough that like other people might have questions about it, um, you can open, if you want to open up dialogue for people to be able to talk to you about like what happened and like the steps that you took. So like, or what your policies are in general, because like you get to decide it's your house and your rules. So like if people want to come play, they, as long as they know what the rules are and can abide by, you know, then they can choose to abide by them or not. But if they don't abide by the rules, see ya. <laughs> That's my thought. I'm like, so not there for, <laughs> you know, like massaging any kind of that stuff anymore. I'm just like, no, thank you. <laughs> There are enough trolls on the internet that I'm like, if you want to, you know, you can find somebody to like go and have the same opinions with it. But if we disagree and it's going to be that contentious, then it's right. over. It's okay. Right. What do you think about LinkedIn? Um, I think it can be useful, but it definitely depends on what you're writing about. Um, and so then who your audience is, right? If you're writing business books, I think LinkedIn is probably amazing. Um, I honestly don't use LinkedIn at all because it's super invasive. It sends me too many emails and like too many notifications. And I just was like, this is driving me bananas. So um, like, I think I still have a profile out there with them, but like I, I never go on there and look at it. Um, but the people who are, again, the people who are active on LinkedIn, um, uh, can really make use of that. Um, so if you feel like that's where your audience is, then I would say, you know, give it a go. And if you're not seeing results though, like then, you know, it's okay to put it aside and try something different. So the whole idea is to, um, is to experiment. And if you want to use LinkedIn for a while, um, and you're like getting no interaction with any of the posts that you're putting out there, um, it might be try to, time to try something different. That is um, a great answer. I always think of LinkedIn as being a place where you engage with people who are looking to employ or if you're trying to get employed. Yeah. Or if you're trying to make professional associations with, with others in your, in your same profession. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I just don't, I don't um, think of it in terms of a 
creative outlet so much as um, yeah. maybe Facebook or Instagram or some of the more. Uh, well, I guess like if you're writing books for people on how to cultivate your um, resume or, you know, your business networks, like those, I think those kind of things um, are definitely resources that, you know, if that's what you want to write about, then like LinkedIn is a place you could put that information and people will um, pick it up because again, they're looking for business um, networks and to find a new job and to um, work on their resume and figure out how to like impress more people or whatever. And that, that is that kind of venue. So again, it's like knowing which audience is where. Mm -hmm. That's great advice for all of us. Are there any other questions? Have we answered everything to, uh, to your satisfaction? And it's a lot of food for thought. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm kind of dizzy with it all. <laughs> Thinking, oh dear, I've broken so many rules already. <laughs> uh, I already told you, Sharon, but Richard is handling an issue over here, so I've got things turned down. That's why I'm not talking. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see, Rick has a question about how to connect with different groups on Facebook. Yeah. I just well, always use a keyword search, but... For sure. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is like search for keywords um, that are related to the, the groups you, you're thinking about joining. Um, and then like depending on what you're joining the groups for, you have to be aware of the rules that each particular community has for engagement um, because not every group that you go into is going to be really excited about you promoting your own stuff there. Um, and in general, I feel like that's a lot of places really don't like to hear self promo stuff, but they do like to hear people um, promoting the work of others. Um, and so like that is the kind of thing that, you, I mean, again, you just need to be aware um, of what the, what the culture is of the group that you're getting involved in. That's um, good advice for all of us to pay attention to the etiquette of any community that you're, you're in. Sense to. the tone. <laughs> Sense the tone. I know I get to ask this question a lot. Um, is it worth it to hire someone to do your social media for you? Um, it depends on two factors. One, um, how much time you think it's going to take um, for you to, to, to get it done and if you have that time to spare or not. And then two, um, how much of your voice needs to be um, ingrained in the things that you're posting. Um, so like, it's possible that you could hire somebody to um, like take the posts that you've curated and that you've written already and to load them into Buffer or on directly onto Facebook or Instagram or whatever um, and have somebody do that mechanical part. Um, it does get a little harder for an individual um, to be able to have that voice um, accurately translated if somebody else is writing their posts for them. So it's something to think about and like figure out what works. Um, but it's not always, if you don't want it to sound like everybody else that's out there sharing the same meme or the same quote or the same images, um, then it's important for you, it's still important for you to be involved there. So, um, let's see, Kate, uh, Kate Farrell has a question about video interviews and um or conversations do you do you like this style where we have a conversation or do you prefer the single person presentation for when you are um trying to share your share your knowledge um personally i like the conversation um i definitely um thrive off of that back and forth interaction and when i'm watching someone else speak as well like there's it takes a lot of talent to be able to um, write and present something that, you know, lasts more than like 20 minutes, <laughs> um, lasts more than three minutes sometimes, right? Like being able to get to your point and like say your point and um, deliver that much information. So like having two people um, 
together to be able to play off of each other and have that conversation. I just, I feel like I connect more to what's being said in that kind of way than if somebody is just um, filtering information to me. So. Right. It's, you got to see the faces. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> All right. Well, we're at one o'clock. Um, are there any last minute questions before we, um, we say goodbye to Elizabeth and uh, give her a, a great round of applause? <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. This was very fun. It and was. Thank everybody. you. And thank you everyone for uh, making do with the uh, webinar format. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. It's all such a great learning experience. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Elizabeth. I certainly learned a lot and I am uh, just now thinking how I can calendar in a review of my, yes. mar my, <laughs> my marketing strategies. <laughs> Put it on the calendar and maybe give yourself, you know, doesn't need to be hours, just 30 minutes every day to like do a little review. Yeah, that's great advice. All right. Well, I, thank you everyone for attending and Barbara. Uh, as always, for organizing this, and I look forward to uh, connecting with all of you face-to-face uh, -face and virtually. We'll have Nina Amir, so. Yeah, Nina Amir is next week. That'll be awesome. Yes, yes. Nina Amir is next week. Um, you can register for that at milibrary.org, uh, and Nina will be talking about mindfulness uh, and getting into a uh, writing practice. All right, look forward to seeing you all. Thanks, Elizabeth and Barbara. And I hope that you get some writing done today. Thank you. <laughs> all right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.